This webinar will begin in one minute. Good afternoon. This webinar offers closed captioning. To enable closed captioning, click on the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred method. At this time, I will now pass this, the mic over to BACP Commissioner Ken Meyer for us to begin. Thank you, Stella. Hello, everyone, and welcome to BACP Empower Hour. I'm Ken Meyer, Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Our goal is to help businesses and consumers get the information they need to succeed by sharing advice and stories from Chicago's entrepreneurs. Art can be found everywhere in Chicago, from galleries to museums, to public squares and street corners. A few neighborhoods have blossomed and distinguished themselves as art districts, including the art district in Bronzeville. And today we're lucky to have Andre Gouchard and Francis Gouchard, co-owners of Gallery Gouchard, located at 436 East 47th Street in the Bronzeville uh, neighborhood here in Chicago. Now, let's paint the picture of their entrepreneurship journey. Welcome, Francis, and welcome, Andre, and thank you for uh, joining us and being with us today. Thank you for having us. Good afternoon. It's our pleasure. All right, um, I think we're gonna have a very nice dialogue for our, for our viewers. Um, and Francis, I think I've heard you go by Fran. Francis, you're kind of like a Ken Kenneth either way. Yeah, Fran is fine. I love okay. my name, yeah. Fran. <laughs> okay, so I think Fran, I'm gonna start off with you on this one. Bronzeville has a rich history in Chicago. Some of the greatest, uh, some of our greats like Nat King Cole, Sam Cooke, Quincy Jones, and many others have hailed from Bronzeville. Why did you feel it was so important to open an art gallery in the Bronzeville neighborhood? Well, um, from my perspective, when I remember my mom, she grew up actually five blocks behind the gallery that we're, where we're located now. And she would regale to me stories about her upbringing. Uh, my, my grandparents migrated to Bronzeville in, in the early 1900s. Oh, wow. And so she actually went to DuSable High School and, um, um, and then many other spaces around there. But she would talk about the Regal and all the greats that would walk around the neighborhood just like it was, you know, nothing. And they were actually, you know, famous and great people, but they were just everyday average people in the community. So I knew there was rich history there, you know, just understanding the Rosenwald, the building that we live in where the Jones brothers used to run policy. And that was the numbers that's now part called the lottery. So the state took it over and turned it into the lottery. <laughs> but then, you know, people would run the numbers and that's how people made money, but also they gave back to the community. So when Andre proposed to me about becoming a partner in an art gallery, I was all over it because I love art and I love our community. And I expressed that Bronzeville, we had several other locations that he could have put the, we could have put the gallery that he actually came up with initially but we decided all on Bronzeville because of the stories that I was able to then help us understand about the rich community. But Andre also grew, you know, was living there as well. So he knew also some of the information that I was able to share. Yeah, if I could co-tell on that too, as a Southside artist, there's a rich long history going back to the Work Progress Administration. And one of those artists, Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who founded the Southside Community Art Center and the DuSabo Museum, were, was very influential on me as an artist and many Southside artists. So knowing the history of so many great artists, and con including the Wall of Respect that was inspired through so many great artist movements, 
that was also another layer of the rich artistic history of having our gallery in such a rich, sacred ground location. Yeah, that's great. Um, the gallery is home to many African-American artists, both experienced and inspiring. Tell us why you thought it was important uh, to showcase African-American art. So while there was a lot, a lot of great history for me, even with my contemporaries in the 80s and 90s, there were still very few platforms for all of us to showcase our work. So there were, there've always been two or 300 artists in the community that you could always gather for a picture and there would be at least that many. So to have one venue to showcase that many artists was far too few, which is part of what the void we were filling with Gallery Guichard. And I have to add that when I first met Andre, um, there were very few African-American artists that I had ever seen. I knew of their work and I could see their works in some of the prints or in books and things of that nature. But to actually know uh, an African-American artist was very rare for most people. So Gallery Gouchard gives that place for artists to be able to showcase their work and for people to get the, the exposure, for them to artists to get the exposure to be able to help them sell their work, but also to get recognized as an artist. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, the Brownsville community, community is in the middle of what uh, we would call a modern day renaissance. In what ways do you think Gallery uh, Gouchard is a part of this revitalization? Uh, I feel, you know, Gallery Gouchard is a, a way to be able to um, allow for programming to happen around the arts, but make it so that it's fun and inviting for people who don't necessarily know the arts. And, you know, it's more about engaging with people, building relationships and showcasing amazing opportunities for artists and collectors and for art enthusiasts. So we have many events throughout the gallery. Um, we have our art trolley tour. We have the uh, Palm Sunday. So I, I'll let Andre tell you a little bit more about the art trolley tour, but our Palm Sunday is our music concert that happens every third Sunday of the month. And people come and listen to jazz music, and we have food and entertainment. So, you know, it's live entertainment. We have bands. The next one is this Sunday on the 21st and we will have Michael Damani. But then we also have art exhibits uh, on a regular basis. Um, in the last four, between June and September, we've had art exhibits, solo shows, two of them for each two artists in the gallery from June through September. And then we also do other events throughout the year. So. Gallery Gouchard is always programming, always creating something new and, and inspiring that not only community people can enjoy, but also tourists as well. And I'll just co-tell on what Francis was saying from a, a holistic standpoint, which is if you think about many of our neighborhoods in Chicago, whether it's Wicker Park, Lincoln Park, River North, Bridgeport, South Loop, all of those were gentrified with a big push by the art community. Yeah. And it's always artists that soften the neighborhood. And for the last 17 years, Gallery Guichard has been one of the pioneers in terms of using art and culture for multi-generational and multicultural gatherings. So you have all cultures coming together in spaces that were deemed very sketchy. 18 years ago, but never did we have an issue with anyone damaging the art, damaging the public art, theft, and it has always been a beacon of hope. So to answer your question, the art is the revitalizer because it gives hope and it also makes regular people think, well, if an art gallery is here, it must be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's how it works sometimes. So it's been a great ride, honestly, to see how art really brings life and joy and happiness to a neighborhood that might have been written off. Yeah. I think that's even true in New York City, where, um, you know, back in the day, like lower, lower Manhattan, where the old um, art galleries, and of course, when uh, the neighbors got taken over and taken over, almost unfortunately, really kind of pushing out the artists in New York. 
Speaking of which, uh, New York City, it's my understanding that the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City now holds uh, Gallery Duchard's virtual exhibition catalogs. Tell us about this amazing opportunity that came about and tell us a little bit about the um, exhibition uh, catalogs that the, the, the Met actually uh, holds. Yeah, this is a great part of our journey. And I think both Francis and I can talk for a while about this, but the first recession, real estate was the fallback on a lot of people were really affected who were invested in real estate. And most of our clients at that time were individual consumers. And when the real estate market crashed, that market also caused us great harm. So we moved a lot of our business to corporations. This second recession and COVID, it was actually the virtual exhibition catalog that was our breakthrough in our lemons to lemonade through the recession and COVID. And it allowed us to stay connected with our customers when we could no longer have people in our gallery. And that technology allows you to drop into the gallery virtually and you can walk around and see now 24 different exhibitions just as though they were brand new as well as speak with the artist directly and it really has become something special because they actually archive each of our catalogs and we're on about number six or seven that they've cataloged and we'll go to the balance of where we are, but we're at number 24. And, you know, with the catalogs, we actually produce the shows. We do an intro, we do the actual show, and then we'll do a thank you for coming out. But it allows for the artist to have conversation, uh, an artist talk, and be able to put that artist talk into a book that is cataloged in New York. Yeah, no, that's great. Tell me a little bit about the bridge um, during the pandemic from kind of having the brick and mortar traditional art gallery and then going into this kind of virtual, more online uh, approach. And I think that's uh, really important in this day and age where I think we probably a lot of good successful small businesses have to have a hybrid approach, right, in 2022. So even if you're a restaurant tour, you may still be serving dinner or breakfast or lunch inside your restaurant, you may even have a sidewalk cafe or a patio. But in addition, you're probably also now having to, have to uh, be able to um, take, take out food and take out deliveries and having things delivered. So um, I think some of our successful small businesses in Chicago have been able to kind of bridge this hybrid. So tell us a little bit about how that, you know, you didn't just say, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end during COVID. You actually like, okay, let's make, I love Andre's, Comment. Let's make lemon. Uh, let's make lemonade out of these lemons that we've been giving to us through COVID. So, how? Yeah. What was your thinking? What was your approach? To that? Initially, you know, um, when it first happened, we had to figure out how figure out how to engage with our audience because you have to initially have an audience to engage with. Because if you don't have an audience, then there's no one to view your your virtual exhibitions. So we did have an audience. Fortunately, over the years, we had built a great clientele and we were able to then reach out to them, showcasing the information that we were holding. And then we also were able to use social media to reach out to people and go well beyond our normal reach. So that was a, a very, you know, um, interesting exercise in you know connecting with your base and connecting with people who were hungry at the time for the information they weren't traveling so they spent their time at home right. they were doing zoom calls with artwork behind them so they were interested in knowing more about the art and as andre said it was all about wellness andre yeah and i think sometimes if you embrace change you can find that in there are discoveries for breakthroughs for your business. And I'll speak specifically to COVID and our business. Prior to COVID, our business was really more about decoration. Most of our customers, if they got a new condo or home, they contacted us because they had new wall space. That was generally who our business or who our customers were. 
after COVID, our business moved from decoration to wellness and it became much more about people connecting to the work. So our model, Art That Touches the Soul, really came full circle in that people were in the, their homes a lot more and the people who had not been collecting realized they hadn't and they were a lot more depressed than a lot of our collective friends. So that need to catch up and learn was, we were able to fill that void with the ability for them to art binge at their leisure and visit the gallery virtually as though it were opening night and they could visit with their family, cozied up on the couch and walk around the gallery as though they were in the space, touch the matter tag, find information about the artwork, title, medium, artists. And on top of that, they could then sit down for a one-on-one -on -one 20 to 30 minute conversation with the artists. This was a challenge that we were dealing with prior to COVID as we were getting more customers and our openings were larger. It was harder to spend time with each of our customers. So if you might get two minutes of time or a collector might get a 30 second uh, time span with a new artist because everyone wanted to talk with them. We now could give you the luxury of speaking, listening to the artist, talk about the work, the inspiration, the mediums. And we've continued that for 24 more catalogs since COVID because we understand that that problem still existed exists now that people are back out it's still hard to connect in a real meaningful way and we're able to still do that and but for COVID and that incredibly horrific traumatic thing in our society we wouldn't have learned that and we wouldn't have been able to connect with our customers in other states whenever we have exhibits so it's no longer a regional product and opening that we used to have so that's really a demonstration of embracing change in a way that can help to scale your business to a different level. Yeah, this is, these, this, these are good lessons because it basically really now you kind of have two business approaches because you, you are still having um, art gallery openings and you have the concert series you just described in person, right? In, in, your, in your location. And then you're also doing all this virtual. Um, so it's almost kind of having two business approaches at the same time. And had you thought about all this virtual prior to COVID or was that, or is like, now we really need to step it up? <laughs> uh, so we could comment, technology even changed during COVID because yeah. prior to COVID, Zoom wasn't a big deal, but there was this new technology right before COVID that allowed you to, interface like Zoom does, how you can switch on and off. And once COVID happened in Zoom, all that expensive technology was then obsolete. So we didn't, and the reason was prior to COVID, everyone in the art world wanted things in person. And technology, most of your presentations were very flat and two-dimensional slideshow slide show presentations. So there wasn't as much art purchasing pre-COVID as there is now yeah. online. And that whole experience is much different and more interactive. Right, right. Brandon, anything you wanna add? Uh, maybe just that, you know, it's, uh, it, it allows for your information to live on beyond the exhibit. Um, I think I might've said it before, but when we had exhibits, they would, be a day and the artist might speak for maybe two minutes and then after that it was over and I think Andre said how now you can gather more information about the artist they're thinking about why they created the work they did how they created it and then now you can go back and binge watch and then a lot of people are making it date night so it's always a lot of fun Glass yeah. wines yeah. and cheese and sit back and watch and listen to the artists. All right, no, that's great. I mean, even, even here at government, we used to have our seminars and our workshops in person down at City Hall. Um, but then we started doing everything virtual. So we still are doing our workshops and our seminars and now we're hosting this type of stuff. Um, and hopefully 
if not getting a larger audience because we're not constricted by the walls of a conference room or a hearing room or a conference center, but just you know by the virtual. And the other thing is for those uh, people today, and I'm sure this is for your folks as well, that you know, are unable to join us at two o'clock, they can watch this uh, later this evening or anytime they want in the free time on YouTube. So um, hopefully um, from the government standpoint, we're also reaching hopefully a larger audience as well, thanks to technology. And I never, I remember when the pandemic first happened and we had the stay at home orders and unfortunately we, the regulators were shutting down business and we're like, well, how are we gonna inform? And they're like webinars. I'm like, what is a webinar? And now we do them all the time, right? We did 300 during the pandemic. So, um, all right, I want to change the topic slightly, which I think will be very interesting for some of our young entrepreneurs uh, trying to get started. Uh, and so for many of our viewers and really entrepreneurs all across Chicago, that are seeking capital for businesses that provides goods and services. Um, how, now you guys own an art gallery which provides a form of entertainment. How were you able to secure capital to open a gallery? And tell us a little bit of some of the financial obstacles you might have run into initially when you're getting started. Well, initially getting started, it was um, you know, we we had our passion and we knew what we wanted to do. Uh, we started the business plan. We all started talking, doing dinner meetings. Um, Andre, being the artist, uh, initially came out with a business plan that we could actually work through. Me being an administrator could put in added my, you know, two cents with administration and business. And then Stephen Mitchell, who's another partner of ours, also was able to put in information. He's an attorney. So we all sat down and talked about what we wanted to do. And that's the easy part, because now you got to get the funding and money to be able to do it. And you know, I, I always tell people to you know, make sure you have good credit. Um, if you don't have good credit, work on your credit, get it right, because lenders want to see your credit score. Make sure you have money saved in the bank so you have something to work with. And then, you know, have a really strong business plan. And then know your, your SWAT, your, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. And if you need to get some additional help, seek help through a guidance of you know, a, uh, a team or a, a school that can get you information on how to manage your money, pay your taxes, and all the things that you need to do to start your business. So when you do your business plan, you have all of the information in your plan that will guide you through your business. I know Andre has more on that too. No, I think those are all amazing uh, recommendations and I'll just coattail with, you know, some advice, whether it's executive coaching, executive entrepreneurship training before you open your business so that you're not paying with your own money and you can understand the back office and front office, but also understanding just because it's an art business, it's still a business and banks look at you as a new business. So if you open up your LLC or whatever business structure it is, right when you open your brick mortar, then that's when your credit history starts. And what we learned as a new business 17 years ago is without any history, no one will loan you any money. So what in hindsight, what we did do that was helpful was we actually opened our LLC before our brick and mortar and started working our business model before we opened to raise and generate capital to help with our build out. We, I would highly recommend that you know your business model will work before you open up. So try your business model beforehand so that you can have that experience also to give to a lender to show that you're just not a brand new business and that you do have experience operating and running your business model. And with the brick and mortar, you should only see it scale and expand in terms of revenues. But the most important thing is remembering this is a business and we had to use our own capital initially. And that required that our business projections 
our business plan had to be square on because we didn't and weren't allowed the opportunity to make mistakes because otherwise we would have been off budget. So that was the other uh, learning lesson early on is we couldn't make mistakes because we didn't have the uh, luxury of credit and capital behind us. Yeah. Now there are pop-ups. People can get do pop-ups and yeah. be able to have events or do be able to you know um, to showcase their product um, or sell their product at the pop-ups. Am I right? And then you can save your money because it's important to make sure you're good you're a good steward of your money. So that way, when it's time to go out for the loan, you have something to to speak with. I think these are great tips for someone who is uh, having issues with getting a loan. You know, they, go into the, they go into the financial institution and they get denied for maybe not having enough experience. Maybe they don't have enough of a good plan written down on paper to convince a loan officer. Any other tips? And these are good tips. So start with a pop-up, get your LLC first. Anything else you can think of for the folks listening today that are like having just a hard time getting that initial uh, startup money? You, you know, one other tip would be understanding your costs and realizing as you become a more seasoned business owner, you also understand how to reduce your costs as well. And investigating your costs to do business before you open up is also important because you can get two or three bids and start to realize for every service that your business needs to operate, there's a best price that's out there and you need to pay the best price, not the highest price. I, and I would add um, collaboration. Um, it's easy to go into business by yourself, you think, but when you have other people that you can bounce ideas off of, or if you have someone who's a mentor that you can work with, it gives you a structure that allows you to move through your business and then have that additional resource and help to get, help guide you through because you'll make mistakes. And like Andre said, those mistakes could be costly, which could actually take you out of business. So you really want to make sure that you have someone that can help you can, you know, bounce your ideas off of, or be able to test your ideas on, or a mentor that can help guide you. And the other thing is, you know, have a, a good clientele. Um, you start building your clientele, get people interested in your product, be different. Don't try to be like everybody else. And we can have a million art galleries like Gallery Guichard, and then, you know, someone won't succeed. Be your original. Be yourself. Make sure that you have a product that is interesting and fills a void or a need for your clients. And, uh, you know, and, and enjoy being in business. Business is not easy. Everybody, as someone told me once, they enjoy the story, but not, they enjoy the glory, but not the story. So right. the story is up and down. And there were times when, you know, it was not so pretty, but then there are times when it is very rewarding being your own business owner. And Andre and I work very closely together. Uh, someone laughed because we're husband and wife and we really work literally every single day together, literally 24 hours a day but we make it work and we have fun doing it and we enjoy doing it together. That's and we're that's right. an effective team and we start with collaboration every day, but two things Francis said, and I'll reiterate collaboration, starting in your business, expanding on your block. Gallery Guichard's success is collaboration. And it is because of the partnership with collectors, art administrators, then expanding out to collector organizations, collector clubs, diaspora rhythms, community entities. When Gallery Guichard started, everyone knew about Gallery Guichard, but I knew the Southside Community Arts Center had been there, you know, since the 30s and 40s. And there was another gallery that came after. So it was the partnering and creating the art district 16 years ago and 50 people used to come out and as many as 5,000 people came out before COVID and we still get close to a thousand people now that people are back in person. So it just speaks to the power of collaboration. And then lastly, and I can't speak to this enough, everyone is looking for a leader 
a, whether it's a political leader, a artistic leader, and we're all the activists that we need individually if we all step up. And I think our community has stepped up in opportunities that have helped us, whether it's in the corporate sphere or where have you, have been art activists that may have been collectors or may know our story, that may know an opportunity in their space, and they help us to have access to that. And that's simply what we all have to do. And I think if you empower as a business owner of an art entity for people to celebrate and collaborate with you, you'll be surprised at how many blessings will come your way. Let me um, just take a step back for a second because um, you both obviously were very smart to think about collecting your customer base and, your, and, and, and getting, you know, ways to be able to communicate them via email addresses or maybe back in the day it was even an old fashioned uh, snail mail address where you could send a postcard or an announcement. Um, for our viewers, just talk a little bit about that for someone who's really getting it off on the ground and how you kind of, and I know it's changed substantially over the years, how you kind of create and develop that customer base, fan base, um, the folks that you just want to kind of be um, in, in communication with that obviously are going to support your business, your activities. Um, and also when, when is it when it's too much, right? When it's like, oh my God, I'm sending yet another email. So just kind of give us some of those, how, how it started out, where you see it today and, and some of your life lessons on that. This yeah, that's... That's a good one. And a lot of people don't like to hear this side of the business, but I think we have to come to terms with while we have an art practice and an art business, it is still the sales and service business. And the sales is part really equates to your relationships, which are really just friendships. Yeah. If you can really manage it properly. And then the service will be the host of education and questions that's gonna come over time with any process of product. So this product of an original piece of art that only you make will always have lots of questions along the way. So if you could just think of it as that simple, the rest of it is just how you do art, your process, and finding a way to capture those relationships and continue to have exchanges with them. So the old days was email and e-blast, but now it's a lot more subtle with social media and then how you're able to continue to engage people because they will forget about you. <laughs> right. And be authentic, be yourself. You know, people don't want to see you doing what other people are doing. They want you to be yourself and they want you to come up with something creative. Again, fill a void and make a connection and keep those connections going. Don't be annoying because you people yeah. can't be annoying. You're, you know, like when you travel and everybody's after you trying to get you to buy something and you really are like, you know, I had enough of it. You really want to be authentic. And then, you know, providing value and a service to that, your client who will eventually becomes your friend or become someone that can count on you for a product that they enjoy. Yeah, exactly. So in addition to being an art gallery, as you, as you mentioned before, the space um, also doubles as an event space for people to rent out. Um, what motivated you to add this um, into your gallery? And at what point did you take on the next step when you felt like, okay, let's, let's take on yet another, you know, another element to the business? Because every time you add on something, it's, you know, it's more work, perhaps more staff, et cetera. It, it was part of our business plan. Yeah. Um, one thing we had multiple business, multiple revenue streams, because if something's not doing well, then you've got something else. But then we also had mentors, as I mentioned, so people to help us and guide us to help us to understand what was important in our business. You know, there was also a inspirational period of our journey where for a 10 year period, we were ambassadors for an international art contest and it was called the Bombay Sapphire Artisan Series and we would literally narrow down 6,000 art submissions to 15 winners that would go to Art Basel every year and as uh, our host for that program and our 
curators, one of the roles was to go into the different cities for the brand and engage galleries and museums. And it was at that time as the curator for this program that I learned nationally how the art event space was a much more viable space than I had ever imagined, particularly with corporations. And some of the amounts of money that corporations would pay to rent spaces would boggle my mind. So I knew this would be um, a space that we could scale and expand in our business model. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Um, as you may, as I think you know, August is Black Business Month. How is uh, the gallery celebrating? Yeah, the gallery celebrates every single day. There are too few African-American businesses. Um, if you start looking back to Africa, Africans were business owners and they had, you know, every type of business, whether it was making clothes or making shoes or whatever it was, they provided a service. So it's really nice to be able to be in a, a space where you see African-American businesses creating their value and owning a business that people can enjoy and feel good pride in. And, you know, there's an opportunity for us to be able to celebrate every single day what we do, how we do it, and what we provide to the community, because you have to give back. It's not just about, you know, saying it's a great business, but really giving back to the community and, and being a part of the community. Yeah, and I'll just coattail with, I am always excited about how our community is really truly multifaceted. And I'll speak to how for the last three months and throughout the summer, we host three different monthly events. The second Thursday, Artini is a networking event, but it showcases how from the 25 to 45 year old, it's a whole different community of young collectors who are upwardly mobile. They're not quite the group that might come to an art opening, but they like the celebration and the feeling of art around them. So that's one group. And then you peel back the onion the third Friday, which is tomorrow of the month, we have double decker buses that take you to five galleries. So you have a little more upscale crowd that really enjoys culture and the different exhibits. Then on Sunday, the third Sunday of the month, we have a jazz concert and blues concert that speaks to the rich hills history of music and culture in the neighborhood. So in one space, you'll have three different groups, two to 300 people each time, but all the same community, all the same space, and it just celebrates the multifacetedness and multi-generational and multicultural activities that happen in a community that if you watch the news, you wouldn't think all of this is going on. Very, very and true. I just add that I'm happy that the city of Chicago uh, is doing this type of program, helping to celebrate businesses, especially black businesses at this time, because it is important because again, as, as I said, there are very few of us and we need more African-American businesses to be able to service, not just the African-American community, but all communities and, and the vice versa with the various different ethnicities within the city of Chicago. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. Thank you for all you're doing for the Bondsville community, really for Chicago at large. Um, okay, so you, you've now gotten us um, thirsty for, for these events. Tell, tell our attendees how they can find uh, more about the upcoming events or if they're busy these next couple of days for the September, October and in, in the future. They can visit our, ga our, our, our gallery at www.gallery.guichard at gmail.com. Did I say that? www.gallery.guichard.com or they can, if they see any artwork or if they're interested in communicating with us, we also have an email address, which is social at gmail.com. And again, I'll spell Gallery Guichard or Guichard, G-U-I-C-H-A-R-D. That's great. And um, before we, I'm going to ask you two kind of final questions just about life lessons. And we'll, we'll open it up to uh, some uh, questions. We got some in the chat. Um, knowing what you know now, 
Is there anything you would have done differently when you were first starting out? Hmm. Knowing what I know now, as an artist, I wouldn't do anything differently because as a self-taught artist, I really needed all of that time to volunteer as a curator, just all that stuff that you don't like to do that you learn so much from. So I wouldn't change much there. But with the business and the brick and mortar, knowing what I know now, I would have actually in our business plan built in applying for more types of licenses when we opened. So not just a general business license, a PPA, a liquor license, a food. I would have applied for all of them on day one. Wow, okay, interesting. Okay. Well, I, I might say a little different from that uh, about that because those licenses are very expensive and you need to really know what you're doing. Yeah. I, I think what I would have done differently is, and I think what you all are doing at the city of Chicago is providing more information for businesses. And so, you know, understanding that um, every business is different and you need more information specific to the type of business that you are trying to open. I would go and, you know, seek more information, delve in and, you know, make sure my business plan, like Andre said, have more information about what it is I need to make sure that when the time comes, when I'm ready for those other licenses, I can apply for them. Making sure one thing that you do need to know, and Andre did say this about the PPA, if you're going to do a PPA, you need to make sure before you sign the lease that your business entity can support a PPA. Because once you sign that lease and you're already in it, and then you find out the requirements and they don't suit the requirements, then you can't do it. So know all of the elements around the city requirements, state requirements, and federal requirements before you go into business. Yeah, I always recommend before you sign that lease, before you choose that place where you wanna have the business, make sure that business activity uh, is, can, can exist there through, through our zoning laws. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna say something, Andre, sorry. Oh no, yep, I agree. <laughs> um, as, this, as this webinar is, is titled Empower Hour, please share a piece of advice that can empower our attendees. Do it now and believe that you are the change that you wanna see and it can happen. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree with Andre, you know, don't put off today what you don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. If you are um, interested in opening a business, start now, do your homework, go out there and figure out what it is you need to do. Start building your business plan, meet the right people, talk to the right people, and you know, make your dreams happen. Um, again, that brick and mortar may not necessarily come right away, but it can come. And you do want a brick and mortar if that's the type of business that business that you're trying to see. Because you know, having businesses up and down 47th Street would be amazing. We would love for more different types of businesses to be on 47th Street. So we ask all of those businesses to come out and come join us and let's change a community one business at a time. That's, that's great. Um, well, before we close this Empower Hour, I wanna check with our producer, Stella, to see if we have any questions or any comments in the chat we wanna share with the audience. Stella. Sorry, my mouse was stuck. Okay. Okay. How do you balance work life? When do you guys make time for yourself, friends, and family? That's a really good question. I'm going to let Andre lead with that because he's the best at doing that because my head is always in the books. <laughs> you know, one of the great things about owning your own business is you do get to control how much you work, but don't think that because you own your own business, you'll work less, you'll be able to come in late only and all the fun stuff is actually twice as much, if not more. And what I find that's important is just changing your environment 
No. Oh, we lost. Oh, it's okay. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, sometimes I find just changing your environment. So whether that's leaving the studio or the gallery and going to a movie theater, riding a bike, uh, just getting outside of the space that you're in is very important. And balance is very important for us, but we'll tend to burn very hard and fast and then take maybe a three day to a week up uh, recharge if we can. But, you know, it, it is very interesting because you are constantly shifting gears from creating to planning to producing to accounting to sales. So it's because you shift so many gear, gears, it's not always the same, which is also in light uplifting. Right. It is very important to balance your, your professional life, your work life, rather, and your, your personal time. Um, and I say get eight hours of sleep if you can, because it's important to get your rest, keep your health up, because it, you know there's so many people who grind and work every single day, and they don't take the time for themselves to, to keep up their health and wellness. And you know, it's also good to have a partner that you can share your, your thoughts with. Um, I'm very blessed that we were able to, you know, balance and talk about things. So one, all the weight doesn't actually happen on one person. We can kind of talk it through. And then when he's up, I'm down or I'm down, he's up, or we're both up and moving it. And, you know, when we're both resting, we're trying to rest and really get some, you know, recharge. You have to recharge your body. And, you know, I, I, if I could just add to, because people think about the art world and you see the luxury of the art opening and the elegance, I think we need to really focus on how physical of a business this really is, where health and physical is never really talked about when you think of art and culture. But our business and our business model and what we do, we couldn't do if we didn't put our health and fitness as a top priority. That's great. Stella, any, any other comments, questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. What art gallery, gallery organizations do you recommend joining? To me, I think you find those that you fit in. Um, there are many of them out there. Just go and research and go and visit and start to, to build relationships. But it's based on you know your relationships and what you're interested in. That's what I feel. Well, let me ask you this. So you, I think it's, it's tomorrow night. You guys are having the trolley uh, tour where you're saying you're going to four or five art galleries. So how'd you get that synergy? Because some some may say, well, that's the competition. Why would they be you know partnering up with another art gallery? Like talk to us a little bit about that synergy and how you partnered with the other galleries. So as a young artist from Chicago on the South side, I've always been a learner and I've always studied models that I thought were successful. And for years, First Friday in River North yeah. were a big part of Chicago's culture. And looking at how, even though you had 20 or 30 galleries clustered together, it brought a lot of people together. So that model was part of the model of early on in 2005 and six, when people had heard of Gallery de Char but didn't know of any other, we knew, and I knew because of the relationship we had with Southside Community Art Center, that we need to form an art district just because people don't know about the neighborhood. So I think the, if you embrace partnering and give what that means to open up yourself humbly, to want to partner with someone, it opens up a different space. And I think people are so used to not partnering or collaborating that we just don't experience it normally. But I think we have to actively go after collaborations and partnerships. And what we found was that even though at that time, maybe more people knew about us, what makes any one entity more attractive, I think in hindsight is always a collective. So the fact that people could have choices over time drew more people to the art tour. So now it's more of a tourist attraction and individually we as art gallery partners will always say, 
the people that come to the art tour are different than the people who used to come to our individual openings. So it, it, the, the whole attracts a larger audience also. So I think when you give, you find that you receive so much more when you collaborate. And again, everybody that has something different going on, you won't see the exact same thing at each gallery. So there's an offering there when people work together, they create that synergy that makes people want to come out and visit each one of the spaces. They don't wanna miss anything because everybody has something unique to offer. Bella? Next question. What was the site selection process and were there any zoning issues? Um, when you go through, you know, um, trying to add something new to your business, you always want to go through the city of Chicago and make sure that it's zoned for the type of business you're trying to put in that location. So, you know, initially we were on 35th Street. There were things we could and could not do there. When we moved to 47th Street, we had learned how to go and find out the information and make sure everything was done correctly. So we knew what was required and we made sure that when we you know, first opened that building, everything was in place. So I would just say, make sure you, you know, do your research, always work with the city of Chicago. Do not skip that because if you do, you will be in trouble. And, and I think this is a very important conversation because the role of a gallery or what a traditional opening looked like then from the 80s and 90s to now is very different and now involves live entertainment a lot. And I think that is part of the learning curve or part of what we would, I would do differently is understanding the merging of live entertainment and the fine art space requires different licenses for the city because once live entertainment is interjected onto a platform, then a public place of amusement license is required. However, if you really look at the movement of what's happening in these type of openings, all of the competition are doing multi-layered, multicultural, multi-discipline type of events, which means a traditional business license would not work. So the, applying that to then zoning, how many people can that space hold, all of that really does apply. And I think that's so, so important that you build that in at the business plan level, because then that will also speak to what area and what spaces you'll even look at for brick and mortar. And if I can, so if I can just inject for a second here, Today, uh, Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, my department, just announced uh, that on our website, we now have a Chicago business zoning guide. We just launched it today. We're just starting to promote it today. Um, when we were talking to the small business community and actually a lot through our chambers and through some of our partners. Uh, one of the constant questions was, can, hey, BACP, can you make zoning a little bit more easier, which is really a different departments, Department of Planning and Development and Zoning. So anyways, um, for the audience and viewers, listeners, go to chicago.gov forward slash business licensing. And when you tap on the business licensing, you're gonna see the brand new Chicago Business Zoning Guide. Um, zoning is not an easy thing. I'm just gonna tell you, even as a commissioner, <laughs> but I, 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 think, I think the guy will help you out a little bit. Um, and, and certainly if there are some streets, intersections, neighborhoods where the business, plan, business, business model that you want to seek is not permitted, then you know to look somewhere else. So with that, still I'm going to turn it back to you for another question. We have time for one more question and then some final thoughts. How do an aspiring artist get a showing at your gallery? That's easy. <laughs> no, um, you can, they can send us uh, an email with pictures of their artwork and with their biography. And you send that to gallerygichardsocial at gmail.com. And that way our curation team will take a look at it. And if it's something that we're working on right now or in the future that it fits with, then 
you know, we'll give them a call. We always we love to, to see new artwork. And then, you know, of course, we talk with artists and help them understand what to do in order to um, be gallery ready. Lots, most times, you know, a lot of artists are new and emerging artists. They're not always gallery ready. So you want to make sure that your artwork is, you know, ready for gallery presentation. Well, I want to thank Francis and Andre Bouchard uh, for uh, taking time today. It's almost actually been a full hour. So I very, very much appreciate it. And I want to make sure I give you folks, you two, one more shout out as to how our viewers can connect uh, with Gallery Gouchard. So first of all, what's your address again, please? www.gallerygouchard.com and that's G-U-I-C-H-A-R-D. And they can also email us at gallerygouchardsocial at gmail.com. And, and street, address, street address? In Bronzeville at 436 East 47th Street, just kitty corner from the Harold Washington Cultural Center between King Drive and Vincennes Avenue. And come out tomorrow and Sunday because we have we're gonna have a great time. Friday and Sunday, third Friday between June and September, and the second Thursday between June and September. Artini. That's great. And for the viewers, for those that have friends, family, business partners that you uh, feel want would like to see or get a, uh, enjoy this uh, Empower Hour, please uh, let them know this will be uploaded on our YouTube, and our YouTube channel is youtube.com forward, forward slash Chicago BACP. And our next Empower Hour, uh, my uh, team here is telling, telling me it's going to be Thursday, September 15th at 2 p.m. And you can find out more at chicago.gov business education. And once again, Andre and Francis, we're going to give you a quiet applause. Thank you. Chicago. Thank you very much. And you guys have a terrific day and have a terrific Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. Yes, Thanks. yes. Okay. Go Bronzeville. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.